My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... The thing is, I want to learn. And as it turns out, I work with people who know a lot about classical music. Every week on this show, one of my coworkers will give me a homework assignment, a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the classical classroom. I am Daisha Clay, and my instructor today is performer and entrepreneur, Mr. Richard Dowling. He is a concert pianist who specializes in Chopin, Ravel, Gershwin, and Ragtime. He plays 70 to 90 concerts per year. He also went to the Moore School here at the University of Houston. He studied with Abby Simon and Ruth Tom Forty. And he also owns Dowling Music here in Houston on the Southwest Freeway at Kirby Richard, you're way too busy, but welcome to the program. <laughs> what, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, two of my favorite subjects you already mentioned um, of those four, a little Chopin and uh, some ragtime. Awesome. And OK, first we should talk about what the link between Chopin and ragtime is. When I was listening to the music, it I, I could understand just sort of orally the, the link, but I couldn't explain it to you at all. So maybe, maybe you can explain that. I don't think there really is much link between Chopin and American ragtime, except <laughs> that uh, someone along the way had had good sense of humor. <laughs> um, and just just so we all are on the same page, Chopin is Frederick Chopin, uh, better known in uh, in East Texas as Chopin. Chopin. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His father was French. His mother was Polish. Uh, so he grew up actually in the suburbs of Warsaw, Poland, uh, was a child prodigy. He was born in 1810, died of tuberculosis in 1849. Oh, wow. He was so um, young. Yeah, he was young. A lot of famous composers of the 19th century didn't last very long. All the diseases that we've eradicated today, mm -hmm. uh, they succumbed to. But his parents and his private teacher knew that he needed to get out of Poland if he wanted to have a career. So he went first to Vienna to make his debut as a teenager and then moved to Paris and lived in France for the rest of his adult life and spoke both Polish and French fluently. Okay. So he was bilingual. That and explains why I've always thought that he was French. Right, right. <laughs> both, both countries, France and Poland, claim Chopin, but he's still universally loved. I mean, his, his music is played on programs thousands of times a year all over the world, not just in the United States. Everybody who knows anything about classical music loves Chopin, whether they know his name or not, they know the tunes. Yeah, I, uh, as I was doing my homework before we met today, I was, I was listening to these pieces and I was thinking, oh my God, I actually know all of these. I don't know why I know them, but it, it struck me as almost a, a greatest hit or something. It is, and yeah. that's why Chopin is considered a genius and his works are considered masterpieces, just like a piece of art you would hang on the wall famous by a famous artist in a museum. Chopin's works are at the top, mm -hmm. you know, along with Beethoven and Mozart. Uh, but the difference with Chopin is that he only wrote for the piano. With a couple of exceptions, he wrote a few pieces for the cello and one for the flute, and he wrote a handful of songs in Polish that nobody sings, but 99.9% .9 of what he wrote was for the piano. That was his instrument. Huh. And what makes him such a big deal is that he was able to make the piano sing like a singer mm -hmm. and write a song without any words for the piano to sing. And mm -hmm. that's why his tunes are so memorable and so infectious, why they've lasted to today yeah. is because they have that that quality of attractiveness that uh -huh. and and melodiousness that makes people fall in love with his music. Yeah, it's really nice music. I mean, I, I know that's such a lame adjective to use, but it is just it's just a, it's just pleasant to listen to. Mm -hmm. um, what about ragtime? Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, ragtime is 
responsible for popular music today. Mm -hmm. And in a way, we can blame ragtime for killing off classical music. Back at the end of the 19th century, there were really only three or four kinds of music in the world. There was concert music, which is what people went to a concert hall to hear. No radio, no television, no internet, no movies. So when people wanted to hear music, they had to buy a ticket and go to a concert and it was a regular part of the fabric of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And the music that they heard in the concert halls was that of Beethoven and Mozart and Chopin and Liszt and Brahms and all the famous composers we talk about in classical music because there wasn't any popular music. There was concert music, and then there was folk music that people played mm -hmm. out in the country, which people right. still do nowadays. Bands of um, gypsies. There, there were uh, patriotic tunes and anthems that people – you know, grow, grow up hearing and singing. Mm -hmm. And then there was sacred music in church. Mm -hmm. And those are the only four kinds of music that there were. There wasn't any such thing as popular music. Mm -hmm. So it was in the South um, that popular music developed and ragtime was the seed of that. And so everything from Scott Joplin in the 1890s to Lady Gaga today uh -huh. is a result of American ragtime, which started... Uh, in Missouri, generally speaking, is the generally accepted sort of center, the Big Bang of ragtime. It immigrated to New Orleans quite quickly because of the Mississippi River, um, and then to the Northeast because, of course, that was a population center. And each each region has its own sort of take on ragtime, but the, the basics was thanks to Scott Joplin, who was from mm -hmm. Texarkana. He was a native really? Texan. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. But uh, he, he spent a lot of time in Missouri because that's where the action was. Mm -hmm. And um, his, his tunes are really today considered sort of like American classical music. Mm -hmm. But ragtime was considered uh, sort of illegal music because it was played in brothels and saloons. <laughs> and so its pedigree doesn't have uh, a great history. Yeah. But today we just take it on its own merit. And the reason people loved it then and the reason why they love it today is because of its syncopation. Mm -hmm. Syncopation is the thing that gives it its kick and, and is what everybody in America fell in love with. And it's what caused all of popular music to occur. And so that's why there's this big divergence between classical music and pop music, because the pop music with the syncopation was a lot more fun to listen to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> guess at what syncopation is. I'm, I'm guessing it's that part of ragtime where you've got one hand that's kind of keeping the the bass beat, and the other hand is sort of playing over Play, here, playing in the cracks in between the strong beats. That's exactly it. Can, can it's not a blood example? disease, you know. It's it sounds a... <laughs> like syncop oh, I've got syncopation. Oh, oh my god, oh, you my know? syncopation is <laughs> acting up. <laughs> so let's do a little a little little example of what is and what isn't syncopation. Okay. I'm, I'm going to play Scott Joplin's Entertainer, the okay. Entertainer from the movie The Sting. Oh, yeah. Um, but I'm going to play it first just as a march. Okay. I'm going to play it straight with no syncopation okay. so you can hear what just a regular old march sounds like. I mean, it's nice. It's all right. But it doesn't give you a kick in the pants. Yeah. So when you take the tune and you put it in the cracks between the main beats of, of the accompaniment and the left mm -hmm. hand, that's what gives it the spice. And okay. that's what syncopation is. It's putting an accent in the wrong place. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that song. 
And, you know, people love the entertainer, uh -huh. and it's sort of taken over the world. You can get the entertainer on a ringtone for your cell phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's 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 great. I I so I and I I think it's kind of funny that that ragtime killed the classical star. What interested you? What okay? What came first for you? I should say the ragtime or the classical? Mm. We, well, I grew up here in Houston, and my mom wanted me to take piano lessons, so I did what I was told. And this is what happens when you do what you're told. <laughs> um, of course, I started with classical piano lessons. So when I got good enough to play some Chopin, I started learning his works. But at about the same time that I got good enough to play Chopin, because his stuff is hard, um, was when The Sting came out. And I can't remember. I think it's 1974 was the year that The Sting won the Academy Award for Best Picture with Robert Redford and Paul Newman. And Marvin Hamlish, mm -hmm. who just died recently, the famous pianist and composer, arranged Scott Joplin's music as the background music for The Sting. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people hear The Entertainer and they say, oh, that's The Sting. Actually, it's called The Entertainer by Scott Joplin. The movie is called The Sting. And I would have been, let's see, nine years old, eight years old when that came out. And so, you know, I fell in love with it, too. Mm -hmm. And I went to Dowling Music which wasn't called Dowling Music. And I bought the book of the complete Scott Joplin collected <gasps> works. And I still have that book. Um, and I learned all of the Scott Joplin rags behind my teacher's back. <laughs> and so that's how I fell in Naughty love with boy. ragtime. <laughs> and now fast forward many, many years. And now I play at all the ragtime and jazz festivals around the country. Uh -huh. And I mix classical and jazz together. And I'm not the only one who does this. Um, other of my uh, pianist friends who are more classically trained um, mm -hmm. take popular classical tunes and we rag them. So ah. we put in syncopation, okay. but we take a famous tune. And so, of course, I love to do that with Chopin. You and, verbed that. Um, that was awesome. Exactly. So that's <laughs> the connection between Chopin and ragtime. Um, it's just being in love with both forms and wanting to have it both ways simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, that's really cool. And I don't know, I thought that there was maybe some um, sort of history, about, you know, it, that <laughs> no. there, was, there was some link between Chopin and Ragtime. And no, Fred didn't live long enough. He only lived to 1849. And yeah. Ragtime didn't get didn't get cooked up until the early 1890s. Okay. In America. Okay. So there's an ocean and about a half a century between them. <laughs> yeah, no link. Okay, well, you gave me a lot of music to listen to before before we came here today. Why don't we get to some of that, and why don't you explain why we're listening to these particular pieces? Uh, this is uh, Chopin's Nocturne in E-flat major, Opus 9, number 2. It's an early work. Opus 9 means it's early. Opus just means work. Yeah. You know, sometimes I, I think that uh, the American public um, who goes to concerts looks at op.9 no.2 and <laughs> thinks it's a website address or something, you know? What does it that mean? It's a strange notation. You know, opus is just Latin. It means work. Okay. And it's a publisher's designation for the chronological order. Okay. So, and it's of the 15 or so nocturnes that Chopin wrote, this is probably the most famous one. N it's got the tune that everybody knows. Tell me what a, a nocturne is. I assume it has something to do with night. That's it. Okay. It means a night piece. Night piece. So it's a okay. it's a it's a piece to relax. It's just a song with no words, something to maybe fall asleep to. Yeah. Um, but not all of Chopin's nocturnes are sleepy pieces. Uh, some of them can be very dramatic. Some of them are very sad. Some mm -hmm. of them are in a major key instead of minor, um, and they're kind of happy. But they're all somewhat nostalgic and quiet generally. Mm. Okay. Okay. Well, let's hear some of it.
So if there's any, if there are any classical music aficionados out there, yeah, I did cut out a couple of repeats just so we could get to more things. <laughs> I didn't want anybody to think that I had forgotten. <laughs> you know, that's that's the thing that I love is to transform things. Mm -hmm. And so it's not. I don't think Chopin would mind nah. <laughs> that much. Nah. I'm sure he'd be cool with it. Well, okay, so there's this other piece that you had me listen to that is called Chopin's Knocked Urn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's K-N-O-C-K-E-D. Next word, U-R-N. Uh -huh. um, and on the cover of the piece... This is by a friend of mine, Ethan Uslan, who mm. lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he's one of my colleagues, ragtime pianist colleagues. And he cooked this up several years ago. Chopin's Knocked Urn shows a picture of Ethan, a, a caricature of him knocking an urn with a sign on the wall that says, here lie the remains of Frederick Chopin with a, some of the dust pouring out onto the floor. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, so very this is a what we call a, stra a stride ragtime uh, transcription of Chopin's Nocturne. Most early ragtime stays sort of in the middle part of the piano. It couldn't be too hard. Otherwise, amateurs wouldn't buy the music. The music isn't printed in too difficult of an arrangement so that most people can play it. Mm -hmm. So that's how ragtime started. It wasn't too difficult. But the players of the day, of course, had bigger technique. So they would add octaves in the left hand and add lots of extra notes and jump all over the place. And mm -hmm. so today, of course, nobody wants to be restricted. Those of us who are professionals get in lots of extra notes. And so Ethan has added notes to his arrangement, and I've added even more notes to it. <laughs> That's what you do when you're a virtuoso. You know what a virtuoso is, by the way? It's a musician with real high morals. <laughs> I don't know. It's, when I tell that to, to school children, they just scratch their head. Anyway, um, so there's a lot more extra notes. There's no right way to play this, but yeah. it's got Chopin's tunes in it. Plus, you might hear, if you're really tuned in at the very end, there's a little parody of Franz Liszt's Hungarian Rhapsody Number no. 2 that makes okay. an appearance in the left hand at the end. Okay, so this so, is a, a rearrangement of a rearrangement right. that you're going to be playing. Okay, got That's it. That's right. There's got nothing it. authentic about this. Okay. All right. <laughs> so here we go. Chopin's Knocked Urn. Okay. Thank you. 
and the crowd goes wild. Yay. That was so cool. <laughs> oh my god. It was crazy to watch you play because your hands were doing like hand gymnastics. Well, like, I don't one have to was... go to the gym for three or four days after playing that, you know? My lord. Yeah, that looks that looks like an aerobic exercise. <laughs> it is. It's a full body experience. Feet and hands. And yeah. now you see why we have so much fun at the jazz and ragtime festivals, you know, yeah. because you get the best of both worlds. It's two sides of the same coin. That's mm-hmm. that's my theory about it, is okay. that you can have a masterpiece. It's a little bit like putting a mustache on the Mona Lisa. <laughs> it's no disrespect, but nobody's going to put a mustache on a piece of unknown art. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're not being disrespectful. We're just having fun. Okay. The melody is exactly the same in both pieces, but it's been syncopated. Okay, got it. Otherwise, the rhythms and, and everything else are, are totally, totally different. different. Okay. So you can hear the melodies are the same, but yeah. totally different yeah. texture, totally different rhythm. It's just the tune is the same. And, of course, a million extra notes have been added, uh-huh. and it's been sped up really fast. Yeah. I love how much music is born out of taking something that already exists and playing with it. Mm-hmm. That's something that I've continued to learn while doing this show, is that so many advances, so many revolutions in music have taken place just just by taking somebody else's piece, taking it apart, doing something new with it, giving it a new spin. That's really cool. Igor Stravinsky did that all the time. And Pablo Picasso, of course, is notorious for having said, I steal. Yeah. <laughs> Dude was a straight up thief. Um, well, it's I, I mean, it strikes me that, you know, when you were when you were playing the nocturne, it was very gentle. It was your hands moved along the keys in a very sort of flowing way. And with the ragtime, you're just jumping all over the place. <laughs> I mean, it's so to not call it serious music. I mean, that takes skill. That is that is well, that's why yeah. I went to U of H forever. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I got to study with Abby Simon and Ruth Tom Vorty. They are both virtuoso pianists, and I've been very fortunate to have a lot of great teachers along the way. But I've also spent thousands and thousands of hours practicing. Yeah, that's great. I, I, well, they, they taught you real good. They taught me good. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so... Um, what are we going to hear next? We've got, uh, uh, there are a lot of words in this list there are, of I, things I do not understand. I was thinking that maybe we might jump to another piece of Chopin. Okay. Um, this is the uh, revolutionary etude. Mm-hmm. Poland's been overrun a million times in its, in its life on the planet. Yeah. It's the country everybody loves to invade. Mm-hmm. And so Chopin, despite the fact that he lived in France his whole life, he never lost the feeling of being Polish. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I live in New York and in Houston. So when I'm in New York, I say I'm from Texas. And when I'm in Texas, I say I'm from New York because everybody loves a foreigner. <laughs> and so um, Chopin always paid tribute to his home country whenever he could. When he was in France. So he composed a lot of Polonaises, which is a national dance, a lot of mazurkas, which is another Polish national dance. And in this particular exercise for the piano, an etude, uh, he called it the revolutionary etude, paying tribute to, um, you know, Poland gaining its independence from whatever conquering country um, it had been occupied by. And so um, it's a it's a dramatic piece. It's really a, an exercise for the left hand. And a, an American ragtime composer, Joseph Lamb, uh, took the left hand part and slowed it down and turned it into a nocturne, mm-hmm. a ragtime nocturne called the Ragtime Nightingale. That sounds like a made-up thing. So ragtime it's kind of nocturne. a little bit of a paradox because he <laughs> took a fast virtuosic piece by Chopin uh-huh. and slowed it down and turned it into a nocturne. 
the first one we heard was a Chopin nocturne turned into a fast piece. Now mm-hmm. this one's going to be a fast Chopin piece turned into a slow ragtime piece. So you see you can do it both ways. So um, this, I'm going to play just a little bit of Chopin's revolutionary etude just so people have the tune in their head. Okay. Although in this case, uh, Joseph Lamb didn't really use the tune. Mm-hmm. He used the accompaniment, Mm -hmm. believe it or not. He used the left hand as the basis for the ragtime piece. So this piece is polar opposite from the nocturne and the nocturne in that the nocturne used the melody. In Mm -hmm. this case, uh, Joseph Lamb is using the accompaniment, the left hand part, as the basis for his ragtime nocturne. Mm -hmm. So it's completely opposite and upside down, which just goes to show you nothing everything's fair game uh, we can use all the spare parts that we need when yeah. we go to when we do uh, a ragtime version of something so first a little excerpt of Chopin's revolutionary etude this is the etude in C minor opus 10 number 12 for those who love the website stuff <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's all I'm going to play. So this is what Joseph Lamb did. He took the accompaniment. And he slowed it down. Thank you. 
<laughs> that was so cool. That was such a that was really lovely. It's beautiful. It made me isn't feel it? like I was in a Woody Allen movie. Yeah, it, exactly. <laughs> and you yeah. see, that's the whole point about classical music. Mm-hmm. Chopin is classical music, and this music, Ragtime, mm-hmm. is 100 years old now, mm-hmm. and it's considered America's classical music. And why is it so great? Masterpieces take you in a time machine mm-hmm. to the past. And, yeah. you, and I just you just proved my point, yeah. which is you said, I feel like I'm in a Woody Allen movie. Like, mm-hmm. when yeah, like he you're takes in you, New York in the early 1900s or something. Exactly, you know. exactly. It's... You just close your eyes and you listen to that and you feel like, wow, I live in a different time period. Yeah. That's the magic of music. I've been a musician now for 40 years. Mm-hmm. And although I know how to create the magic, I still don't understand the power that that music has over human beings. Yeah, I still can't figure it out. It has a power over me yeah. when I listen to it and when I play it. But... How do sound waves affect our emotions? Right, right. It's, In the same way that smells it's do. Mysterious. It's mysterious. And that's why we all love music so much. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether it's rap or Joplin or Beethoven or yeah. whatever. People need music in their lives. Absolutely. And it, this kind of music particularly has a nostalgic quality to it that mm-hmm. makes people reflect on their existence. It's talk about emotional manipulation. That's... And people have been trying to write down <laughs> what music is for a couple of centuries now. Yeah. And even in our conversation, people are nodding their heads going, yeah, yeah, I, I understand. But you can't really explain the power yeah. of music in words. You just have to do it or listen to it. And that's why we all still go to live concerts. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that replaces the excitement oh, yeah. of a live performance. You're sitting For here sure. four feet away from me and going, wow, that's incredible. Yeah. But, you know, it's not just to see something, it's to feel it in person. Yeah. Well, to feel, I mean, in this room, in the Gary Performance Studio, you can you can actually feel the vibrations coming off of the piano. Right. It's sort of like a full body experience of right. the music. I think it's it's so interesting just to just to see how classical music gave birth to this thing that clearly changed American music forever. Right. And it's it's influenced the world. I mean, American popular music is what 95% of the planet listens Mm -hmm. to. And uh, you can't deny that. But classical music will never go away because these are masterpieces. And, you know, even there were even classical composers who wrote ragtime. Probably the most famous example is Claude Debussy, the French Mm. composer, wrote wrote Gollywog's Cakewalk. (laughs) A cakewalk is a kind of a ragtime piece. And, uh, you know, piano students are still learning Gollywog's Cakewalk. And that's Debussy writing his own ragtime. Well, Richard, thank you so much for taking time out of your crazy busy schedule to come in here today. What a pleasure. What a pleasure. (laughs) Everybody, if uh, you have a question about something or uh, would like us to do an episode about something in particular, send me an email at dclay at classical917.org. If you want to hear past shows or see resources about our particular episodes, just go to classical917.org backslash classroom. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.